kind of a sick school is this? Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. You're going to need a bigger boat. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me sure. You got spunk. I hate spunk. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Oh, righty. How are you doing? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Stand up to my little friend! Ah! I love to celebrate from in the morning. What are you people? On dope? Stop whining. I got a crap on deck that can choke a donkey. Hey! Who is your daddy? I'm sorry, but all questions must be submitted in writing. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Can I do that? I'll be back. A Daniel Man! Up your nose when you left home. What? I'm sailing! I'm sailing! Groovy. You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it. Pull it down. Nothing's never having to say you're sorry. Here's looking at you, kid. We got no food. We got no jobs. Our pets' heads are falling off! Go to the coast and get together. Have a few laughs. Hear that, Elizabeth? <laughs> I'm coming to join you, honey! I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. I love it when a plan comes together. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Put it up to a Eleven, mark. exactly. One louder. Why don't you just make ten louder and make ten be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to eleven. We're on a mission from God. Hello, and welcome to episode three of Then Is Now podcast, a podcast where we teach you about stuff that you may or may not have missed out on, all the cool stuff that you really should know. Today, we've got a great episode for you. Spency, Don't Peace, and I are going to discuss the original Poltergeist and the uh, 2013 or 2014 remake. I always forget what year the new ones come out. But before we get into that, um, there's a couple of housekeeping items here. So just to give out our contact information, if you want to leave us a voicemail, which we'll play on the show, our number is 207-619-2889. You can also email us. That's thenisnow42 at gmail.com. You can also see us on facebook.com slash thenisnowpodcast. You can message us there and get a discussion going about the uh, the topics here on the show. And our website, of course, is horrorhaven.com, so if you want to check that out. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Otherwise, enjoy the show. I have a bad feeling about this. How could I possibly be expected to handle school on a day like this? Food fight! Hey, you in my class? Oh, yeah, I'm today. I think you should consider transferring to shock class. Woo -woo! Now, now, very few students are severely injured in shock class. Bueller. When you were in school. Bueller. Did you ever cut class? Bueller. Yeah, I guess I did. Sure, most kids cut classes. Good, sign this. Um, hit back. I get so lonely when I hear that third attendance bell ring and all my kids are not here. Seven years of college down the drain. Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. We lack discipline. As long as I'm here, there will be no grades or gold stars or demerits. We're going to have recess all the time. Woo! Go, play, and have fun now. Okay, we're back here with episode three of Then Is Now podcast, and today we're going to be discussing um, Poltergeist, the original 1982 Poltergeist, and the 2014 remake? 2015. 2015 remake, thank you. That is my co-host, uh, Spency Dompiece. Welcome, Spency, to the show. How are you guys doing? Yeah, um, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, Spency, real quick, just give out your contact information just so people can have it. Uh, very simple. I have a YouTube channel, uh, Spency Dome Piece. Uh, that's Spency, S-P-N-C-Y space Dome Piece, one word, D-O-M-E-P-I-E-C-E. -E -E. It's very simple. I just post gaming, stuff like that, and then, of course, social media, Twitter, Instagram, that kind of stuff. Not very complex, so that's all it for me. Cool. And um, before we get into everything, I want to um, go over a few things. Um, we have a little housekeeping to do here, and... 
Um, one of the things I want to explain, something that I did wrong in last episode, which is the Robocop episode, when we started to talk about the actors, I kind of got frustrated because Spencer didn't know who they were. And then I glossed over it and just continued on. And I think my error was I probably should have talked about who they were because the whole point of this is to educate people on, you know, who the actors and creators of the film and that sort of thing are. So we're going to try to rectify that in moving forward. Now, the other thing is uh, we did get a piece of correspondence from a listener named Kevin. And um, he gave us some constructive criticism on the show, so I'm gonna. It's a little hard to read because it's um, it's kind of wordy, but I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna try and just paraphrase what he says. But basically, he thought it was um, he said he thought the podcast was exceptional. Um, he thought the intro was great, uh, many iconic catchphrases, and then he um, he liked our voices. He thought that the purpose of the podcast was explained well, but he thought we could improve things by expanding on what the benefit is to the younger audience out there. Um, Give them a motivation to want to listen to the show. I know my own daughter has heard us recording, and she, like, is basically like, you know, I would never listen to that. (laughs) So, well, we want your feedback. We want, you know, Spency, what are your thoughts? I know you've had some concerns about this. Yeah, that's just something that's – I don't personally sit down and listen to many podcasts, so just the whole – it, uh, like sitting down listening to this one, it doesn't make it feel any different anymore, any bigger or better than other ones. Just to give it like, just because it's aimed at someone doesn't make it kind of any different than everything else that's not aimed at the at our generation. You know what I mean? So you, I like more incentive to give us to get people my age, like 15, 16, something like that, to listen to this and to take the time out of their day for it. Well, what would you recommend, then, t- that we do differently here here at the Then Is Now podcast? Uh, I don't really know kind of what would really get someone to listen to it, but... Well, should know. it be... Should we have rap music and fast-paced? <laughs> that doesn't always work, but uh, possibly pacing. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> okay, well, let's continue on with this letter here. Um, he also thought that it was interesting that we used the word anthropomorphize, but he thought that it should have maybe been explained, but that's just kind of how we talk. <laughs> and he also said that um, you know he was a little confused by our terms that we used, which was kaiju movies, Toho, uh, about halfway through. we would we, He thought the discussion got a little too advanced for him. I think he's an older gentleman too, which I think that's the whole point is that we need to – we need to um, – you know, explain this sort of thing maybe a little bit better to the audience out there that doesn't know what Toho might be or what it means to be anthropomorphic or, or to anthropomorphize, um, which, of course, that just for those who don't know, it means you're putting human characteristics on a non-human creature. Um, and then the last of his letter says, I am the reverse of what you want to do or your expected audience. I watch the old stuff and Oh, and discard or don't watch the new stuff. But your podcast made me curious about maybe watching some of the new Godzilla movies. So I thought that was cool. Thank you, Kevin, for that. So, Spencey, have you been watching anything else uh, interesting lately? Um, I did recently watch a couple movies. Uh, the movie Priest uh, that came out in 2011. I watched that. Oh, yeah. Um, I also watched the new Dracula Untold movie. So I've been on a bit of a vampire craze for the past couple days. <laughs> I've seen Priest. That's the one with the guy that plays Jarvis or... Um, um, in the Avengers movie, he becomes Vision. the Vision. Yeah, yeah. I can't think of his name, of course. He was also <laughs> in a movie called Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe, which uh, is one you should see. That's a really good movie. Hmm. Yep. But how was the Dracula Untold? I have not seen that one yet. I thoroughly enjoyed it for what it was. I believe it was the beginning to the whole new Universal shared universe, like the whole Wolfman, Dracula, Mummy, Frankenstein. I'm pretty sure they're bringing that back. I haven't seen anything else past Dracula Untold, but I like Dracula Untold for a good origin story of Dracula and things like that. I know some uh, critics would say they made him a hero, but for me, I would say they didn't exactly make him a hero. They made him the protagonist of the story and not so much kind of ravaging on humans. Like they, In this movie, they made him human, which is something you've never really seen before, so... Not gonna give too much away, but they did they did things differently, and so they they ground him a little bit more so than in yeah, previous and I think ones. because the beginning of the movie starts with him not being Dracula. This is how he becomes Dracula, not kind of him terrorizing people already being Dracula. So that's that was interesting. There's one thing worse than being Dracula, and that is not being Dracula. Very witty, very witty. <laughs> I concur. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah. Um, what did we see recently? We watched. Um, I watched, um, oh, Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, which was a 1981 TV movie. 
I think you've seen that, right? I have seen that, yes. Yes, that was a good one. And um, the new, the Ouija uh, Origin of Evil. That was good. I I've seen that. that as well, yeah. I Apparently like that. that's a prequel to another Ouija movie that came out a couple of years ago, which I did not realize that. I kind of fell behind on that one. I don't really follow modern horror movies. They've kind of yeah. traditionally <laughs> lost me. But Ouija Origin of Evil, um, I sat down and watched that because of um, my dad and my sister. So, you know, uh, I enjoyed it. I thought it was kind of clever for being a newer movie. Yeah, yeah, I thought it, I thought it was uh, very well done. I thought, um, oh, and the other one we saw, I think you saw it as well, was The Shallows. Which, yes. That was really good. I thought the first half was better than the second half, but I thought that the actress in it really sold sold the whole thing. Definitely. I didn't thoroughly enjoy it myself. I found it just to be kind of a simplified version of Jaws, right. which I liked a bit more. But I feel like the way, but for what the movie was, I feel like they executed it well with yeah. with the actress and with the whole being terrorized by one shark. It was it was really kind of interesting because the distance you could see the shore. It wasn't like she was out of out attacked on, like on a boat. She was very pretty close to the shore, so it was kind of just tantalizing. Like you could just it was you could, frustrating. You could make it, yeah, <laughs> you're like you could make it if you weren't so wounded and being terrorized by a shark. Right. Yeah. The premise of the movie is that this this girl is surfing and she gets cra- she crashes onto a rock or the shark bite a shark bites her surfboard or bites her I think. Yes. And then she crashes onto this like rock jetting out of the water and she basically can't get to shore. Sort of like that scene in Tremors where they were trapped on the rocks and they couldn't get out and uh mm. had she had a, she has to figure her way out and I thought she really sold it though. I believed her. I believed her pain. I thought when I walked into the movie I was thinking oh it's just another one of those models for, you know, made for a sci-fi movie or something, but no, I thought I thought she did a really good job. Mm, definitely. Definitely. So, all right, now on to today's films. Okay, Poltergeist, 1982. This film was directed by Toby Hooper, who is famous for directing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, back in, I think it was 74. Um, and it was produced by Steven Spielberg. Now, I saw this in the theater when it came out, and it at the time, it was an event movie. It was, I mean, Spielberg in 82 was at the height of his game. He had already had Jaws, Close Encounters, and Raiders, Raiders of the Lost Ark under his belt, and um, and a few others. But this was this was going to be the, you know, the next big thing. It's definitely got Spielberg's stamp all over it. In particular, when you see the ghosts and stuff, it sort of has that feel like at the end of Raiders, um, when the ghosts were coming out of the the Ark. They kind of it kind of reminded me of that. I didn't quite see the Toby Hooper stamp on the film, and I know that there's some debate out there as to whether he actually directed it or, you know, was Spielberg holding his hand throughout the whole thing. I don't know if you've heard anything about that at all. I don't know too much about Toby Hooper myself. I have I know Steven Spielberg. I've seen hundreds of his movies. You could tell that he was had a hand in it. But like like you said, Toby Hooper, I don't know too much about him. So I don't feel like this is, was a really movie a movie to kind of get to know Toby Hooper as a director. Right. Like to, to understand his style at least. We'll have to explore him in future episodes. He's done things like The Fun House. He did the remake to Invaders from Mars. And just several other movies. In fact, I think he's been doing some TV stuff lately. Now, of course, uh, we talked about Spielberg. The the actors. We've got uh, the family here, and um, the father is played by Craig T. Nelson, who um, he went on to great success on a TV show called Coach, which I never actually watched, but apparently was very popular. A lot of people watched that over the years, and he uh, modern audiences might know him better as the voice of Mr. Incredible from the movie The Incredibles, which I hear there's talk of a sequel. Which would be awesome because that that's a great film. Yes, uh, Incredibles two, I believe, has been announced. So right. I know they're doing. I, I believe they timed it. I what did it come out in two thousand two? I think something like that. Yeah. Um, one of the famous lines in Incredibles is "You were fifteen years too late." It's coming out in twenty seventeen. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> fifteen years after two thousand two. That's funny. Um, and he was really good as uh, Steve Freeling here, the father. He's tied in to the whole plot of the story of what's going on here. We'll explain that when we go over the plot synopsis. Um, his wife is play is Diane, played by Jo Beth Williams. She's been in tons of stuff as well. She was in Kramer vs. Kramer and uh, The Big Chill. 
among other things. I think she's done a lot more TV stuff in recent years. She plays Diane, of course, the mother. And uh, then we've got uh, Carol Ann, who's played by... Um, Heather O'Rourke. Heather O'Rourke. She, now, she's got an interesting story, Spencey. Why don't you tell us what happened yes. to the little girl? Uh, Heather O'Rourke, she was an American child actress, and she kind of started acting somewhere around the age of five. Uh, Steven Spielberg was looking for a six-year-old who want who to play um, Carol Ann for this particular movie. And uh, Heather O'Rourke, she actually kind of failed her first audition, but Spielberg totally saw something in her and asked her to come again. And somehow he said he he said to the mother he, she has no idea what it is about her but she has the job, and that's awesome. That's kind of the story of how she got the job at what age five, something yeah. like that. But um, she met with kind of a tragic ending though, right? Yes, she did. Uh, she had something. She had Crohn's disease uh, during the at the after the release of Poltergeist two and during the filming of Poltergeist three, and uh, it says here that. At some point uh, during Poltergeist 3, you can actually see the puffiness in her face. But she never complained about anything like that. She was never worried. And she actually, the day she died, she felt she was like trying to actually go to school, even though she fainted on her kitchen floor. Oh, jeez. And the ambulance finally came. And somewhere around 2 in the afternoon, she died from cardiac arrest at the age of 12. Oh, that's terrible. Yes. I've heard so many rumors and stories over the year. They were saying that Poltergeist was a cursed set because she passed away and... I think even the something happened to the older sister too, the Dana, the actress that played her. Um, I don't really want to get into all that craziness right now. I think we should just talk about the films and not, you know, speculate on, um, <laughs> you know, theories that may or may not be true. So, Spency, why don't you give us a brief synopsis? Synopsis. I can't speak today. Of Pull the Geist from 1982. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, the movie starts out on this family with a young five-year-old daughter, uh, an older possibly 10-year-old son and a 16-year-old daughter, and, of course, the two parents. And it starts there. They live in California, and the father, he lives in... He uh, works for the real estate company that built the neighborhood. They were the first family to kind of move in. And essentially, based, what happens is it kind of, like, devolves into this kind of haunting, and it gets progressively scarier and scarier because Carol Ann seems to be the only one who can actually communicate with them, She's she kind of talks to them through the TV when it goes to static back in the 1980s with the um, going to static after the national anthem. She would talk to them there and they kind of came into the physical world and started to throw things around, started to move things and scare the and scare the freelings living there. And they ended up calling in a parapsychologist to kind of to kind of look around and see what they can find. And they find a lot of crazy things going on. So the parapsychologist um, uh, leaves with all the data they've collected, comes back with a psychic. And the site, and, uh, oh, I totally glossed over one of the major points. Right, I was just going <laughs> to say. I was just thinking. Um, before, uh, before they call on the, site, the parapsychologist, Carol Ann gets taken by the ghosts into the right. other plane of existence, I would say. So, so that's the whole plot is trying to get her back. And they can kind of hear her through the static of the TV. Yes. she. They have some form of communication. It's not easily understood, but it's kind of – she's in the house, but she's not in the house. Right. She's dimensionally displaced, she's, I guess. And so essentially the psychic uh, with the allied with the family and the parapsychologist kind of work together to get Carol Ann back and attempt to – and the, and the ending is very um, – amusing to me because it doesn't actually end with them with the family surviving and the house intact and everything the family ends up running from the house near the end and and everyone believes that the ghosts are gone as soon as carol ann comes back they're gonna move the next day they stay the night but the ghosts come back with a huge vengeance for the spoiler alert obviously but they come <laughs> back with a huge vengeance trying to take carol ann trying to take um the young robbie and essentially the family finally gets away and runs and the house just kind of implodes on itself right and totally get ends there and for, for those who haven't seen the film if we haven't already ruined it for you you better go out and watch it before you listen to the rest of this podcast because we're going to go a little <laughs> deep into the film here okay so yeah that's the basic premise um it's one thing i learned that was interesting was i watched the documentary on the dvd i don't know if you got a chance to see that spency but um mm -hmm. that one of the things they said in the documentary was that um these 
what happens in the house throughout the movie and to the characters are all based on real experiences. Although I don't think it's one isolated incident. I think they took a bunch of different things that were reported over the years and added them, you know, put them together into a movie. Hmm. Interesting. And now I wanted to t- also talk about the for the audience out there for the for you young folk out there watching this show listening to this podcast the the whole thing about the static on the television I know Spencer you weren't around when this this was going on but back mm-hmm. in the day back in the day we had television we had five channels and we loved it um, seriously though yeah we we had a limited amount of television channels there was no cable there was no satellite. And the television channels didn't run 24 hours a day. Most of them stopped around, you know, midnight or 2 a.m. And they'd play the Star Spangled Banner and they would go to static until about 5 or 6 in the morning at when which they would resume programming. And they would go through this whole thing. I used to get up at like 4 or 5 in the morning and sit there and watch the test pattern that would come up, which was this sort of circular mm-hmm. rainbow colored thing that they would use to test the colors, make sure they were broadcasting correctly. Although most of our TVs were black and white back then. And um, they they had black and white test patterns as well, but that's a that's a story for another day. However, um, you know, I would sit there and watch the test pattern, and they would play music. And mm-hmm. in fact, they played one that was um, it was called I found out recently actually it was called Hooked on Classics. I I, sh- I found a video of it online, and I shazammed it. So maybe we'll play that um, a little bit of that later on in the in the show. <clears throat> um. So anyways, yeah, so that's what was happening. So the father had fallen asleep in front of the television in the living room. The snow is playing, and Carol Ann has got her hands on the TV set, and she's, you know, answering questions. And the, the, mother, and the, the mother and the other children wake up, and they come down the stairs. They can hear Carol Ann talking to the TV set, and she's, she's going, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, I'm only five, yeah, uh-huh. So it was interesting. It was creepy. Mm. Creepy as all heck that while she was doing that, you know, establishing this relationship. And then there was another scene later on um, where she's in the parents' bedroom and she's talking to the television. And I thought it was a funny blooper. When they showed the TV up close, the time would read – I think it was the time would read like 2.53. And when they showed it far away, the time would read 2.39. I don't know if you picked up on that. Oh, I never saw that. Yeah, there was a little glitch in the way they shot it. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) Um, but that's the, the iconic moment of the film is when she turns around and says, they're here. They're here. You know, that was the whole, I think, catch line of the film, too, was mm. they're here. Mm. And, of course, in the sequel, it was it's they're back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't actually seen any of the Poltergeist sequels. I know it goes to Poltergeist 2 and Poltergeist 3. have not seen any of those. Yeah. I, myself, at least. <laughs> They um they they weren't all that good. Um, there are some good moments in the sequels, but uh, like I know Heather else. O'Rourke uh, became like Hollywood really kind of. She I believe she either got her star or she got she became like really re, um world renowned for her Poltergeist two role. As yes. far as I know, that's yeah. really what put her on the map more than the first one. Right. Yeah, she probably would have had a you know glowing career as an actress ahead of her. It's really uh, I also tragic. Know she was on other shows. She was on Happy Days. Um, oh for yes, a little bit. Fonzie's girlfriend towards the end of the series. I uh, also His know girlfriend's daughter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She had rec- she had a recurring role in Happy Days. Uh, let me see what else I can find on Heather O'Rourke. Um, she also had a recurring role in Webster, and also the new Leave It to Beaver. Oh yes, I do remember that. <laughs> that was a very short-lived show. Yep. <laughs> They couldn't couldn't capture the magic of the original Leave It to Beaver, which is another show that we'll discuss <laughs> at some point. Now, the the, the paranormal investigators are uh, I think they're from a university or something. Yes, uh, one of the parents I believe has like went to the university, and so that's kind of where they first like their first reaction is to like, get someone who will at least believe them for the beginning and try and help them. Right, and, and meanwhile the the. Um, the family are experiencing these weird phenomena in the house, so that's why mm-hmm. they call them in. And uh, I thought it was a hilarious scene when they first sort of 
the investigators realize what's going on and the, the lady that runs the show is shaking and the teacup is just clanking in her hands as she's trying to drink the tea and things are moving around on the table and they finally determine that it is in fact a poltergeist or more than one poltergeist there. Now mm-hmm. poltergeist is German for angry ghost. Well, I always heard angry ghost. In the film they said it slightly differently, didn't they? Uh, they said a noisy ghost. Noisy ghost, yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so the poltergeist are in the house and they've got to figure out, you know, what's going on here. I think at this point, has Carol Ann been sucked into the television? Yes, she was uh, sucked into the television before they even went to the psychologist. That's right, that's right. Mm. So, and of course, the poltergeist try to drive them away. The one guy with the glasses ends up seeing, like he's eating a piece of chicken and he drops it on the countertop and there's maggots on it and mm. a piece of, excuse me, a piece of meat is crawling across the the countertop and other meat is spewing out of it, and he ends up ripping his own face off. And then, of course, it's all a dream, and, or it was an illusion uh, to him, which that was horrific. When we first saw that in the theater, people were freaked out. We couldn't believe that that was in a PG movie. <laughs> Nowadays, you see that all the time, that kind of thing on television. So, yeah. <laughs> Yep. That part particularly scared me because I, like, I just didn't like it at all because saw, you saw the little pieces of his face dripping into the sink. Yeah. And it's just kind of... It just freaks me out seeing it because I seen this movie as a little kid. So when I when I saw it, I I, I flipped a little bit in, in my home. Never never saw it in the theaters, but I flipped a little bit in my home. My dad had to calm me down. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, it's 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 amazing what they get away with in some of these movies. And you know, like I said, now they're showing this crap on TV all the time. So um, now they, these investigators they end up catching some of these ghosts on videotape, which. Mm-hmm. What's funny about that is, I mean, back then, that was a very difficult thing for an amateur to fake. Nowadays, we have a lot of computers, computer uh, software that we can use to, if we wanted to fake something like this. It's very difficult these days to prove whether something is really captured on tape or not. But um, I think that that right there, I mean, I guess the story would have gone in a whole different direction. But I thought it would have been interesting if they... I mean, that's huge, what they caught on tape there. That's, like, groundbreaking. It's never been caught before that to that level of what they showed and i'm surprised they didn't really capitalize on that but like i said i i I think the story probably would have gone off in a different direction Mm. you know who knows maybe after the incident these paranormal investigators release it to the public or something and yeah definitely would have definitely changed the entire the entirety of the movie right um and then there's a funny scene where that where um uh what's his name craig t nelson's boss shows up and he, the piano behind him is moving, and Craig T. Nelson just sort of escorts him away, so he doesn't actually see the piano move. And then the light outside on the porch starts to get really, really intense. I just uh what I liked about the movie was the kind of the haunting during the day. Like it wasn't just oh it happens at night and they're always trying to kill them. It's no, they're just they're just moving the stuff around. They're just being themselves and not really kind of caring about what they do to other people. Right. It's kind of just so it's not so much that they're have it out for the family. It's that they're just kind of inconsiderate of whatever's around them for moving pianos and things like that and that's one good thing about this movie is that it's it's not so much the jump scares although there are plenty of them it's the creep out factor that makes it work and the fact that the child is missing and the family is concerned and all these crazy things are happening it's like you said it happens in the daytime so it's not just the spooky old dark house scenario where it's Hmm. at, at night and stuff i believe the tagline for the movie was they know what scares you Yes. So that kind of psyched people out to, like, they, they know exactly how to scare you. They know what, what really makes you tick. Yeah. I think also taking Carol Ann is kind of a huge thing for the family. Right. Because she's universally loved. Yeah. <laughs> I would say. And, well, that's just it. You take the most innocent piece and, and you know, that makes it all the more, um, you know, you take her and so that makes it all the more frustrating and imperative that they retrieve her because she is only five years, six mm. years old. Whatever. Um, now, with the boss there, um, his goal is he's trying to get Craig T. Nelson to come back because he's been out of work now because of all this craziness happening at the house. And he's afraid that he, he doesn't know what's going on. So he thinks that he's being wooed by another company or a real estate company. So they take a walk and they're overlooking the neighborhood and they're standing by this graveyard. And the boss is just explaining to him that, yo, yeah, well, we're just going to move everything over and, you know, we'll put, you get, we're going to put your house right here and this will be your front window and you'll have a view of the, of the neighborhood. And I thought that the whole scene just really added to the creepy tension of mm. the film. Yeah. 
just because like how ignorant the outside world is a i think kind of put a whole put a perspective on really what poltergeists are capable of and how kind of how kind of common they are because you don't really hear much about them unless they do something significant right and the fact that this poltergeist is pot like this kind of gives a little bit of light as to how the fob is connected to the outside world and the something about the poltergeist too which i don't want to give away just yet yeah one of the major key points and it's interesting too because they don't really like there's no way you can go into the history of this house because it was just recently built Mm. so there's really no explanation as to why this phenomenon is happening now zelda rubenstein plays uh tangina barons i think that's her name uh yeah <laughs> she's the psychic and when she shows up it's kind of funny because the father says what is this your knott's Berry farm solution <laughs> which i thought was a riot and if you don't know what that is you're gonna have to look that up or check our show notes um it's not our job to tell people what that means <laughs> um so she comes in and she's sort of in tune with what's going on here and she's able to home in on carol ann and the fact that she's She's sort of in this, um, you know, other dimensional place. We don't know if it's heaven, hell, or purgatory. It's almost like in. Have you seen Stranger Things? I have not. Okay, it's it's almost like that. There's this sort of other dimension that exists in the same same place as us, but like a different. I guess I guess you'd call it a different vibrational attunement, um, sort of like using the Flash thing. So they figure out that um, the focus of everything is the closet in the kids' room. And they decide to throw a rope into there. Actually, they throw a couple of tennis balls through first, where one of the paranormal investigators like writes something on it, like tennis ball A or tennis yeah, ball B. Yeah, it was B. like a one and two. One and, and two, three. yeah. And so, um, just to add on to what you were saying is the they find that the entrance is the closet, but an exit is through the ceiling of the living room, um, where Caroline first uh, talked to the TV people and the through the TV. So they find that there's a entrance and an exit in and out of this other dimensional plane so the rope goes in and it comes out the other way so they have a line one in the other right so um when that was a great effect too of the spectacular light coming out of the closet Mm. it reminded me of course of the ending of of the manitou which i know is one of your favorite movies (laughs) i've seen that movie and the movie i was really enjoying it up until the last 10 minutes (laughs) Really? If you haven't seen the Manitou, it's 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 a special kind of B movie that I think should be enjoyed. But uh, getting back to this, um, so uh, long story short, the mother ends up going um, through on the rope to try and go into the other dimension to retrieve Carol Ann. She's successful, comes out the other end into the living room, and um, the father carries them both to the bathtub, which they already have ready, filled with water, cleans them up, and and they're fine. Mm. Mm. They um and then they they decide to send the um the kids to the Holiday Inn on I-74, and I thought that was kind of a funny uh, funny scene where, well, first of all, we see that Joe Beth Williams, the mother, has, like, gray now in her yeah. hair. Yes. And uh, obviously, you know, this harrowing experience. She's seen something, uh, uh, you know, a piece of the universe that most people don't see. It's very Lovecraftian, actually, that, you know, something like that would happen to her. And um, when they mentioned sending the kids to the – Holiday Inn on I-74, the older daughter Dana. Is it Dana? Yeah. Yes, Dana. She goes, oh, yeah, I remember that place. And the mother's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> she's like, uh, she's nodding with a little grin on her face. I remember that place. <laughs> and uh, just uh, the possible implications with that scene are very amusing. Right, right. <laughs> so um, we go back into the house again. And um, they're starting to move their stuff out. They're basically, they're going to leave. And they're packing everything into a truck and they don't really specify where they're going to go, but they're, for whatever, they're just no. getting the heck out of there, but yeah. they don't get out there fast enough because <laughs> they spend one more night in the house. It's the last night. The, the next day they're going, I think I actually th- pre- I'm pretty sure that the father planned on, um, planned on coming back and picking them up and they were going to go that night. Right. But, the, but he was still at the office. So the kids were, being put to bed at least for a little while right so only the older sister gets sent away yes. the two younger ones are with them and she was over uh, i believe a friend's house a friend's house yeah and um the mother gets like blown up the wall and across the ceiling which i didn't really um say it before but it, it's a really interesting the way they did that was and they've done this before in other movies and in videos is the whole set was 
on a rotating thing and everything was nailed down or glued down or whatever and they literally rotated the set and kept the camera stationary and that's how she went up the ceiling and everything so the camera stayed where it was so that it looked like she was going up the wall and across the ceiling and everything oh. and it was great it was brilliant effect <laughs> for that time um very spielbergian again where you get these slimy tentacles coming out of the um the kids room doors there everything's being sucked into the Thing which I thought they had packed up, and there's still like a zillion toys flying around the room being pulled into the, the closet and everything. Uh, I think they had boxes of stuff that was knocked over, though. Right. I believe they had stuff like that. Oh, that could be it, too, yeah. yeah. So the two kids are in the, the, in the original room because they, they shared the room, the closet, and right. that's where Carol Ann was taken originally. Taken originally, yeah. yeah. So the mother gets them out of the house, and or no, the mother, she ends up, she can't get into the room to save them at first, and she ends up outside. And falls into the pool, which is still being dug. And it's just a pile of mud. It's a big hole in the ground filled with mud. And when she falls into the water, because um, it's now, of course, it's raining and everything's going haywire, all these dead bodies start popping to the surface and coffins start popping out of the mm. ground. And that's when we start to realize that something's not right here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, there are actually people buried here. Right. And then two neighbors show up, right? They help pull her out of the pool, but then yeah. they don't go. She's telling them that there's, you know, craziness in the house and my children, my children. The the wife, and the guy's a big burly guy. Yeah. She pulls him and doesn't let him go in to help. I'm like, that guy could have taken on them ghosts, you know? Yeah. I, I, that I did not understand, but I was willing to accept human sanity kind of going out of out of their body there for a moment. Right. So so the father finally comes back. The mother's up trying to get the kids from being sucked into the closet. And um, coffins and bodies are everywhere, and that's when it hits him. That's when Craig T. Nelson's character realizes the truth of what's going on here. His boss shows up, and there's a great shot of, you see, the camera is over Craig T. Nelson's shoulder, and all you see on the other side of him is the boss's eyes. And as he's telling him, screaming at him what is happening, now here's going to be the huge spoiler here, um, the, the the boss can't do anything but his eyes just widen in horror as when he learns the truth that he says to him, you move the gravestones, but you didn't move the bodies. Of course, he's screaming that at him, and that's when we realize, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Son of a bitch, you moved the cemetery, but you left the bodies, didn't you? You son of a bitch, you left the bodies and you only moved the headstones! You only moved the headstones! Why? Why? Now, what I didn't get at first was that I'm like, well, don't they have a basement? That Why wouldn't the bodies have been dug up to begin with? But I guess those houses don't have basements. Uh, it takes place in California. Right, so, so they don't... You wouldn't have them in, with earthquakes, I believe. Right. I live in New England, so I wouldn't I was going to say, yeah, so do I, so I didn't know that. <laughs> Basements are common for me. If you don't have one, you're weird to me. Right. So I guess I guess it makes sense, though, for the geography. I mean, yeah. the fault line would kind of limit you in underground possibilities. Yeah. But that scene right there, that to me was Toby Hooper. That was just mm-hmm. intense when he's screaming at the boss and the boss's eyes realize, oh, crap, you know, because the ramifications go beyond just this one house. I mean, obviously, this is the focal point of this, these bodies, but it could happen to all of them. And, you know, everything that he holds dear in life, which is money and real estate, is going to go down the drain, mm-hmm. as well as the people who live in this neighborhood. So, yep. Yeah, so that's it. So they escape from the house. And, of course, um, the house gets sort of sucked into this singularity point at the closet. The whole entire thing is just gone, pulled in. And in very Amityville horror style, the family uh, rides off. I think, do they have the dog with them too? Oh, yeah, they have, the, they have their own yeah. dog. Yep. So it was very similar to the ending of the Amityville horror where they're just getting in the car. They don't care what they've left behind. They're just taking off. And uh, um, we end on a, on a kind of a funny note, actually, where they get to the motel. Oh, the daughter shows up before that. Oh, yeah. Right the, uh, as the house is being destroyed. Yeah, she she steps out of the um the friend's car, and she's like screaming, uh, at the top of her lungs because the house is imploding, and they're kind of trying to fit the family into the car. And one neat little touch I like that you like would have to have a keen eye to notice is when she's screaming, you can see her like her neck. She has a hickey on her neck. <laughs> so it just kind of gives you some clue as to what she was doing. Right. She was out. <laughs> I thought that was a great little character touch to yeah. throw in there, you know. Because uh, the Dana didn't really have many lines. No, in the entire movie. they didn't expand really on her of, character. So I, I feel like through subtle touches like that, just kind of added something to her 
more than just her lack of lines and her, the fact that she exists, but she's not super imperative to the story. Right. So, so um, the family finally, you know, beaten, bedraggled, get to the motel. They walk in on they're on the, like the second floor balcony, walk into their room. They go into the room and shut the door. Door opens up again, and the father wheels the TV out, <laughs> puts it on the porch, yep. and the balcony, and then walks back in again, and shuts the door, and that, that's how we end Poltergeist from 1982. Now let's not forget the score was uh, uh, I meant to mention the music in this was done by Jerry Goldsmith, who he's done a zillion things from the Star Trek movie to Planet of the Apes to um, Gremlins, mm. all mm. kinds of things. So and and in this case too, the score is really good, really uh, fits the film very very. I thought it was very Raiders of, of the Lost Arkish, even though that was John Williams. It, um, possibly. There was something about it. I found it very um childlike. It was kind of like piano based and very very kind of calming, but for the context of the movie and everything that happened is not very it's very unsettling. Right. More like it, and I feel like he kind of did that intentionally. Right. Just to hold that. Once again, the tagline: "They know what you fear. They know what you're afraid of." Is just kind of put you at more unease to have this calming music and the horrific scene. Right. I think so. I think it worked out really well. Yeah. It was it overall it was movie. well put together. Um, so Spency, um, what did you think of the film, and would you recommend it to a younger audience? Yes, and yes. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this film. Thought it was excellent from start to finish. Um, the pacing I thought was well. Most older movies I found have not so much like pacing issues, but slower pacing because of the times and me being me and my generation probably wouldn't find, wouldn't be able to handle it too much. I, and I sometimes enjoy it. So it's not super bad for me, but this movie got quickly to the point of something was going on. I believe in like the first night we meet the family, Caroline is already speaking with the TV people. So it just kind of like adds to the creepiness and it, the whole D the whole general kind of evolving of, where something crazy happens, it becomes a parlor trick, and then it becomes a nightmare. I feel like they they paced it so well, and they kind of kind of put it all together that I that my generation would enjoy it. I yeah. I enjoyed it. I think like if we sat down and watched it, like someone from my generation, 15, 16, 13, 14, would be would say, you know what, I'll watch that again sometime soon. Yeah. I feel like that would work. I feel like that would happen. Yeah, I that. agree. I think that it definitely it holds up. It doesn't. It's not dated. Mm, not it's, at all. it's an 80s movie, but you don't get that, you know, feeling that sometimes you get from an older film that it's it's just too um, too much entrenched in the culture of the time, mm. in that it doesn't you can't relate to it. This you could totally still relate to it. I feel like the only dated part is the um, the static, right? After because that, the TV yeah. cha- stations shutting down, right? Yeah, exactly. Definitely a kind of a like a reflection of the times. Yeah, no doubt they thoroughly used all the technology available. Which I think kind of added to it, though, because it kind of just showed what, like, how the spiritual world affects the physical world. Right. Especially through technology and electronics and things like that. And keep in mind, too, at that time, the um, the the general public didn't know as much about ghostly phenomena as we do nowadays. Because mm. now it's it's another one of those things like UFOs and sharks and dinosaurs that have, have come into the mainstream that most people have a good general knowledge of these things. Whereas back then, we didn't know, you know, a poltergeist was a new term, at least relatively new term in the pop culture. You know, we had ghost stories. I mean, we'd ha- we've had them for, you know, since the yeah. beginning of time. But <laughs> this w- method of investigation hadn't really been done. I mean, my grandma used to spin yards about a spectral locomotive that would rocket past the farm at night. (laughs) Okay, so that was Poltergeist in 1982. We're going to take a short break here, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, the remake from 2015. spine-tingling, nerve-shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Kid Radio. Here are your hosts, Derek M. Cook, and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not-so-classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher or visit MonsterKidRadio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. 
Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Bryce, and Joel Hodgson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Classic Monsters, Modern Talk, and the head of Rondo Hatton. Only on Monster Kid Radio. Are you troubled by strange noises in the middle of the night? Do you experience feelings of dread in your basement or attic? Have you or any of your family ever seen a spook, specter, or ghost? If the answer is yes, then don't wait another minute. Pick up your phone and call the professionals. Go Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters! Our courteous and efficient staff is on call 24 hours a day to serve all your supernatural elimination needs. We're ready to believe you! There's no way we can oh, live here. come on. There are power lines. Relax. I can feel the gym is swarming already. Oh, no, no one's getting tumors. Mom, there's a kitchen! Oh, wow. Okay. Let's Slow down, please. I have a very motivated seller. Do you want to see Jake? I'm kind of truck. <laughs> Mom, we like this house! I think things are looking up. <laughs> I think there's a storm coming. Stop being such a baby, Griffin. We didn't know where else to go. You did the right thing coming to us. This doesn't seem to be a classic haunting. This is unlike anything I've seen before. It's a new, more powerful poltergeist. Natty? We need you to come back to us now, honey. Hi, Clear your minds. They already know what scares you. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about the 2015 remake of Poltergeist here. This film was directed by Gil Keenan, who hasn't done very many films. He did about nine films so far. Um, his first one was the animated movie Monster House, which is a very good movie. And I believe he's slated to direct the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, although I think that's up in the air. Um, There's a lot going on with that movie. I know I've been uh, keeping tabs on it particularly, um, and it's... It, there's so many different things that are trying to go into it because um, the game developer wants a lot of creative control, things right. like that, so you can't force anything on that. Now, the star of this film is Sam Rockwell, who plays the father, and he's he's a good actor. He's been in a lot of stuff. You probably may have seen him as the uh, as Zaphod Beeblebrox in the um, film adaptation of Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He was also in a movie called Moon, which was an independent film about an uh, astronaut stranded on um, space uh, moon base. 
up on the moon, of course. And um, it's it, that's a really good science fiction kind of story. And he was also most notably, and at least uh, in my book, he was in a movie called Mr. Right that came out last year. I mean, he's been in tons of stuff, but Mr. Right was absolutely uh, hilarious as he's this um, assassin who tries to break away from being an assassin and he ends up uh, falling in love with this girl and, and he becomes her Mr. Right, but then she realizes he's he's like on the hit list of these other assassins and they're trying to kill him and it, it's a really good action comedy he's got this sort of he's got this not power per se but he's in tune with the universe and how that whole thing plays out is is really hilarious so he's able to just sort of you know a bunch of boxes will fall off of a, a countertop and he can just catch them all at once and it has to do with his being in tune with the universe and that's why he's such a good assassin and he slaps on a clown nose before he kills someone <laughs> it's a really good movie I've never seen that, but now I have to. Yeah, you have to. I highly recommend it, Moon, uh, Mr. Wright. And I think the other thing he was in, he, wasn't he in, in Galaxy Quest? I think he was um, he was the guy in Galaxy Quest that was the red shirt. And he's like, oh, they don't even give me a last name. Uh, <laughs> I think that was one of his first roles. I don't know. Possibly. And um, who played the wife? It was Rosemary something. Uh, Rosemary DeWitt. DeWitt. I wonder if she's related to Joyce DeWitt from Three's Company. Which Three's Company is a show that I often quote quite a bit. It's really scary. <laughs> Spencey's making this bizarre face as he's laughing. <laughs> well, you're not wrong. <laughs> um, and then the daughter. The the daughter was uh, in this. The character's name I know was Dana uh, was Moen. Dana Moen. Yeah, it was no, Maddie sorry, no, was no, the no, character. Sorry, Dana, not yeah, Kendra. What, Dana was in the original. Right. Kendra is the new one. Oh, the older daughter. Yes, yes the older daughter. Yeah. And then the Carol Ann character is actually called Maddie in this. Ah, uh, yeah. Our full name's Madison. They just call her Maddie. Which I wonder if they changed that because, I mean, she's also got black hair, not blonde hair, mm. like in the original. So I wonder if because of the whole stigma of the film having a curse around it that maybe they tried to change it so yeah. bad things wouldn't happen to them. Yeah. It seems like some of these things you would kind of like keep. More like um, right. like, a lot, like kind of the names and just the whole, just a lot of the settings and things like that weren't – um brought from one to the other right so that possibly could have a good implication on it it's it's funny too like the or the the film um well hold on um the the little boy mm. uh griffin bowen griffin bowen uh, he's played by uh let's see oh so the whole all the family has different the whole family's name is different in this yeah uh his name is griffin bowen and he's played by kyle catlett and what's he been in i He's known for the young and prodigious T.S. Spivet, uh, Poltergeist, uh, The Pale of Settlement. Uh, both both the, the young and prodigious T.S. Spivet and Settlement were in 2013, and Poltergeist, I believe, is one of his most recent hmm. in 2015. Oh, yeah. He, he looked familiar, but... Yeah. And uh, now we've got the psychic guy who was... Um... Uh, his na- the actor's name is Jared Harris. And... He's been in tons of stuff. I remember him mostly from Fringe. Mm, mm, same. He's not much taller than me. <laughs> it's not a height contest, Spenty. It is with me. <laughs> oh, he's also announced to be playing young Dumbledore in Fantastic Beasts 2. Oh, cool. He was very good in this, I think. I really did like him uh, playing the psychic character. Uh, in the newer movie, they brought more depth to him, so I feel like he really kind of captured... The whole concept, uh, do we want to go and do a synopsis? Yeah, let's do a brief synopsis. It it essentially plays out like the original film, for Mm. the most part. Mm, For the most part. Uh, There are a few minor details that I think kind of affect the story, in a way. So do you want to go? Yeah, go ahead. No, you can go. Um, So, it starts off, once again, in California, same state, and the family is just moving into this new house. It's their their first night there, and you kind of get a feel for the family, that they're they're not the um the father has been out of work for a little while the the mother is a stay at home mom who's trying to be become a successful writer so they're they're financially struggling they're really trying the older daughter Kendra is not very helpful due to her age <laughs> I, She's I teenager, can relate yeah. a- angsty teens we're we're a problem when they kind of first move in uh the tree is one of the first things that they notice uh that kind of is a bit of a giveaway. The tree in the original movie had uh, faces and things like that in it, and it kind of looked really creepy. Yeah, the weeping but willow. The, yeah, but um, I don't think it was a willow in the original. 
No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It but was, in the new one, the new it was. One it was yeah. So there's that. Uh, the family is just adapting to the new house. Uh, they're trying to get a feel for it. There are a few good um, non-poltergeist-related scares in there. Uh, so I thought there was that. Um, and soon things start happening. I'm actually starting to draw a blank as to what exactly happened. <laughs> oh my god, this is... I just saw this movie. <laughs> oh, not me. The parents go out for a, um, like a, kind of a dinner date with the new na- with the neighbors just to kind of acclimate them to meet everyone. And so Kendra is babysitting the two younger ones, Griffin and Maddie, and, um... Uh, it's actually interesting because uh, Kendra plays a the older sister plays a bigger part in it. Right. She um, she was kind she was um sitting on uh, her phone. She was just kind of kind of just doing her own thing, and then her phone started to like, kind of go haywire, and she tried to find the source, like the crazier, like not normal phone glitch. It was obvi- It was evidently poltergeist activity if you've ever seen the original. So she try goes to try and find it and gets attacked by one of the poltergeists. I won't explain how, but um, she gets she essentially gets stuck in one of the rooms for a little bit, and Maddie is uh, talking to the TV uh, while Kendra is out of it, and Griffin also gets attacked by um, the clown. Right. Griffin. Gr- Griffin. Gets he attacked he by finds the, clown. the clowns in his yeah. room, right? There's he, like a, um... the clown is not his personal possession. The clown was found in the house with a bunch of other ones, and that particular one uh, attacked him and tried to. Trying to hit that and the tree both attacked him. And Griffin uh, bl- plays also a bigger role in it because he has a lot braver. He goes to help Maddie when she's she's kind of stuck in her room. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, she talked to the TV and then she's in her room as and she's scared because the closet is starting to freak out. Obviously, the right. closet in her room. And Griffin gets attacked by the tree before he can go down and attempt to help um, Kendra. So finally, the ghosts <laughs> let Kendra go, and the parents come home and. Uh, they fi- they find Griffin being attacked by the tree, obviously right. grabbed, and he falls to the ground. They bring him in, and obviously Maddie's gone. Yep. Maddie has been sucked into the closet. She is nowhere to be seen. So once again, same old story as they pull in the um, the parapsychologist and her little team. They start to set up things around the house. They try to find Maddie, and once again, things just get crazier and crazier and crazier up until... They, ha- they have to bring in the psychic. The parapsychologist calls uh, the cavalry, essentially, is what they refer to him. Uh, fun fact is, in the beginning, they had a little foreshadowing. He had, like, a TV show where the whole, this house is clean. Right. The famous phrase. It was hashtag, this house is yeah, clean. <laughs> that, was the, that was the name of the show. And he would go out and, like, find these haunted places and kind of... And I, I think he would, like, try and get the spirits to go to go to the other side and to clean the house, essentially. And so they call him... And the kind of the cool part is that when you first meet him, he's, he seems like this war hero, just kind of like this this psychic who really just kind of gave up on really focusing on all that stuff. But he he, he really develops his character because he and the um, parapsychologists have a romantic history, which it kind of brings some depth to him, I think. So uh, to move on with the story is he kind of goes around, one same thing as the original psychic, uh, Zelda, I forget her last name. Zelda Rubenstein. Zelda Rubenstein. <laughs> Goes around, he finds where Maddie was taken, and they kind of, and they kind of do a lot of detective work to find out if she's here or not. And so once they decipher that she is here, they find um they use one of the the little kids' drone, Griffin. They use his drone with a camera on it, right, and a heat sensor. Which they, that was really cool. They did something different. Was they sent it into the through the closet into the um other dimension to find Maddie, right. And it was really cool because you don't get to see that in the original uh, Poltergeist. You really, this was really kind of unique to the new movie, which I enjoyed. It for being a remake, it they gave you something different. The effect of the other world was mm. really good too. Mm. I mean, it was a lot of computer generated, but it was very effective. I thought mm. it really mainly it really mainly focused on the whole collective anger of all the spirits. Right. And it kind of and it didn't really focus on the whole one particular poltergeist with all the minor spirits around him and they weren't all just standing around they were mushed into the walls mm. and you know coming out of the walls and ceiling and the floor and waving their arms and stuff in very great creepy fashion mm. and so you could obviously and then Maddie was seen in there she looks the way she was when she got sucked in but she's the only evident um living being in there right so the so the drone gets struck down by something 
And they and uh, what happens next? I'm trying to blank on this movie. I don't remember. I, I think that just shows how not very memorable this one is. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I know. I moved the table. I think it was pretty pretty much like the original, where they they uh, they threw the rope in there. They threw the rope in there. Oh yeah, and then the little boy goes in. Yeah. Uh, the the. Or, like the original, the psychic was like, "I gotta go in, I gotta save her," and then the parent, and then but in the ori- in the new one, the parents start arguing about who should really go in to try and get Maddie, and Griffin takes the initiative, uh, immediately goes up and and uh, attaches himself to the rope and runs in after Maddie, and right. we actually kind of got to see as, as, as the audience um, him talking to Maddie and how. Um, and Maddie's kind of stuck there, and how he pull, ends up pulling her out right. through the same the same way through the closet and out the ceiling. And um, I feel like the and also the the father picked them up and brought them over to the tub filled with water. And I feel like it was more dramatic in this one. Yes, Definitely the tub scene was it was like kind of were they going to survive? Was her she's still alive there? Griffin came to relatively quickly, but um, I was about to call it Carol Ann. Yeah, Maddie uh, <laughs> is kind of. Kind of, it's like it's a little iffy whether she'll survive, but luckily she does. And what happens next? They stay one more night, obviously. Oh no, I'm sorry. No, they don't stay one more night. They are. They're all. Everyone's leaving the house. They are all like, okay, we got Maddie back. Let's leave. And um, everyone's okay. Everything's calmed down. And this was something I addressed in the original. Was they? Everyone's like, oh, this house is clean. And Maddie's sitting in the back seat of the car. Everyone's getting ready. She's yelling at them. They're not. They haven't left. Right. They didn't go into the light. They're not. They're still there. I. I just left. Right. And and at that moment, the ghosts attack them in their car and send them back into the house, trying to take, put them back in the closet and into their world. Yeah. And that was kind of a critical moment for me because I'm because when I watched the original, it was well they didn't really get rid of. I was thinking to myself they didn't really get rid of anyone. They just kind of saved Maddie, uh, uh, Caroline. Yeah. Which is good. Which helped the plot, but it's like. The family was a little, I think, a little too ignorant. I think it was the psychic's fault. I think the the ghosts though were, the, the ghosts were cleared from the house, but the portal was still open. So that's what ended up sucking the original house in, because the bodies were still there. They still were restless. Whereas it's funny that you said that. Like I watched it myself last night, and I don't, or yeah, yesterday, and I don't remember, or maybe it was two days ago, but I don't remember <laughs> a lot about this film too. It wasn't very memorable, no. I have to say. Uh. Well, all I remember is um, in the original, kind of like, well, you didn't really get rid of it. You guys really didn't do anything about them, and it kind of bit, it bit them in the ass. I think. Right. It kind of came back to haunt them. <laughs> Good choice of words. But um. But I liked I liked how the new one kind of immediately immediately addressed that. It's like, no, they're not gone. They're still here, and it kind of, and it just took them a second to realize it's second too late, and they right. were attacked. Um, and it, to finish off the movie, the psychic. Um, I forget his name. He went into the portal to try and send them all to light. He was going to lead them all away from this, from this suffering, this plant, this um, limbo. And uh, in the end, once again, the family's driving away, and the house kind of. In this one, it didn't so much like um, implode, but it really kind of. It was shrinking. That's right, because it, it reminded me of Lost in Space when they were inside the robot because he got giant and he was shrinking back to normal size, and they were trying to get to the exit on uh-huh. his foot, and everything's getting smaller and smaller around them. They're getting or relatively bigger and bigger. It yeah. was kind of like that. That's what was happening. Yeah. It was like a beak. It was like they actually were going into the light and not just kind of a void. Right, and then the bodies did come up from the ground, but it wasn't as impactful. As in the uh, the original, these just sort of floated. There was like that black ooze. There was this black ooze everywhere. Mm-hmm. And these bodies just started to float out of it. And it wasn't as effective as when Jo Beth Williams falls in in the original into the pool. And they're all popping up around her. And, you know, but I also feel like on a more... sanitary level, it's just really <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> That's true. But I, in the new one, it was more of a constant theme. Right. It was, uh, when, they went, when the parents went to the dinner party before all the scares started happening, it um they were kind of like, oh... I'm pretty sure they moved the bodies. They should have moved the bodies. As far as we know, they moved the bodies when they built this right. uh, neighborhood. And so that was like a constant theme. Like when the um, like the equivalent of the face tearing off scene, yeah. the father had that instead of one of the paranormal investigators. And he and he was basically, you know, in the during the day actually, he you could see in the reflection of his sink, 
his face just kind of started to melt into this black ooze, which, and he started puking up mud and worms and things like that. Right. And if you look at it, it's really gross, but I feel like it also was a reflection of the constant theme that the bodies were there, that there was still covered in dirt and mud, that they weren't actually moved and they weren't at peace anymore. Right. So I, th- I definitely think that that was more of a constant theme. I feel like the entire movie just kind of expected you to have seen the original and just to kind of give it the time of day to kind of give it a whole reimagining of the first movie. Yeah, it just seemed overall like every element of what made the original film good was done in a less impactful way in this film. Like even when Carol Ann says in the original, she says they're here and in the new one, the Maddie doesn't quite do it quite that it's mm-hmm. it's and they're called the lost people. Yeah, I feel which, like that, but that was just a reflection of the times, though, because right. of, the, of the static. Which is what a kid would say. They seem like lost people. But her, when she says they're here, it's much less – it's just more of a matter of fact, oh, they're here. You know? <laughs> oh, who? What? Who I cares? Know, um... <laughs> What's going on? They're here. Well, in the new one, she says, um, she says, they're coming, they're here. It was, it was, in, a, in the original, they had, you saw the beam. It was up, a buildup. It was the blue beam coming from the TV to right. the wall. But in this one, it felt more like Maddie was kind of their ticket out of there into the more physical world. Yeah. It, it, it kind of felt like, like Maddie was like, they're coming. And then like, and then everything kind of started to happen. The whole, the kind of like the earthquake scene with everything kind of going haywire. And she turns around again, they're here. Like she's kinda like, Come on, what are you waiting for? You've seen the original was right. the feel I've got. The feel I got from it when watching it. I thought the the clown scene was scarier mm-hmm. in this one. Yes, they kept the there was a major scare in the original where the kid checks under his bed and the clown the clown is gone. He checks under his bed, the clown's not there, and um and then he you, you the camera pans up to him and the clown's behind him and attacks right. him. I remember when I first saw it. That scared that, me. That was pretty intense. That got me, and they kept that. They kept that. Um, yeah. I I fully expected that in the new one. Still got me a little bit, but I expected the kid kind of looks under his legs because he he sees the clown's nose. In the new one, the clown you pull its nose and it says something. Right. And he saw the nose kind of dangling under his feet, and he and he he like looked under. There's nothing there, and then you come back up, and the clown's behind him. And right. That was him. effective. I thought that scene was good. Yeah. Definitely. This um the thing about the father too is not being an employee of the realtor company, again lessen the impact. It was more it was more of an unnecessary subplot of him like when he goes to the hardware store, looking for a job and, you know he it's just it takes away the impact of of that whole scene that we talked about in the original film when he confronts his boss and says you move the gravestones which didn't move the bodies. They don't it loses that here. Because he doesn't have that attachment to the company, so mm. that that's what I thought about this. It was definitely that. Uh, I also think though it made it kind of more impactful because they were on their last dimes when he went to the hardware store looking for a job. They um they were running their credit cards were overdue. They, right. they had probably no cash. It was just kind of like they're on their last pennies and then they get attacked by a poltergeist just to top it off. Right. Kind of doesn't really. Uh, <laughs> it, it kind of makes you feel really bad for them, I think, yeah. more than like, well, you you played. It was more from you played yourself to, oh, that's horrible. Right, right. Feel. So I think it was two different. I think they're two broadly different movies. I suppose that's a sign of the time too, of the economy just being bad nowadays, mm-hmm. whereas mm-hmm. it was pretty good back in back yeah, in the eighties. Yeah, you have one working parent and still be able to afford a really nice house. Right. Yeah. Exactly. The um the other thing I was gonna say I'm sorry I apologize my notes I I wrote took my notes while watching the film and it was in the dark so some of them I'm having a hard time reading but um something oh you wrote those down yeah mud cell phone body given away Griffin yeah uh, that reminds me um this like I said the cell phone they really used the technology like the whole there was no snow in the in 2016 2015 you mean on the TV yeah on yeah. the TV. There's no snow, so um. But there was static. Yeah, the the ghosts caused the static. And right. Something I liked was they had kind of hands on the opposite side of the TV. Yes. Which I feel like that kind that of that was creepy. That gave it the fear, the the feeling of like there was no since there was no normal constant snow, and she was just kind of talking to nothing. 
but and that gave you the creep off factor because you saw the snow nearly every night. Right. But I feel like this was because like it kind of gave it away that there was some there was a lot of people back there trying to get out. Right. Through the TV or through Maddie, which I think I think gave it a different scare, but just as effective in a different way. Right. Me, at least. And one other thing I thought was interesting too was um the banister uh the 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 bottom post of the staircase banister would like give off a shock, mm. which is weird because it's wood. Um, also the, um, I thought the psychic character here was, mm. it was interesting how, like, I liked what they did with him because he had had a, re- a previous relationship with the head of the paranormal research team. I think they were married at one point. Or? Uh, yes. When they were a lot younger, they mentioned that they had been in fact engaged. Right. And, um, so that was kind of cool cause they were sort of rekindling that whole thing throughout the film. And then by the end, he's he's got its own show, another show. But then she's in it too, investigating along with him and acting kind of dopey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he, you know, he was all ready to just jump in to the other world and save Maddie. I keep wanting to say Carol Ann. And um, the, it was the boy actually stole his thunder and ran into it. Whereas in the original. Zelda Rubenstein was going to go in and Joe Beth Williams convinces her, no, 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 I should do it on the mother. Because they go through that whole thing because Zelda says to him, who is she more afraid of? And, you know, who doles out the punishments? And it was the father. So the father, she tells him to talk sternly. But then when it's time to figure out who goes in, this is the original film now, who goes into the portal, the mother says, no, you got to, you're strong enough to hold the rope. Let me go in. And she tells, she convinces Zelda Rubenstein that she should go and she's like, you're right. You should go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or she really didn't want to. And she's a frail older woman. I don't think I, I think it would have taken a physical toll on her where especially like the way they fall out. Whereas in this one, he's kind of, you know, he's an older man, but he's still energetic and vibrant and, mm. and in shape. So he could have easily run through and tussled with the ghosts and, yeah, you know, grabbed her and come out the other side. Uh, something they also did was since he has the show, This House is Clean, um, the family was like. Uh, at least the mother went to this parapsychologist. She says, he knows this can't be on TV, right? And, he, and the parapsychologist says, yep, he totally knows. He's no problem there. And so it kind of like, he wasn't in it for the glory. Right. He really, he was not interested in like trying and getting this publicized at all. He just wanted to get the kid back because it because he felt he was responsible for it. Right, exactly. So I thought that was, for me, that was the highlight of the film. I liked that character, what they had done with him. Okay, so overall, um, what did you think of this film, and would you recommend it to a younger audience? I liked it. Uh, I definitely the original 1982 so much better, uh, but I feel like this one had its merits, um, A, in comparison, but as a lone movie, it really wasn't that bad. I definitely feel like if there was no original 1982 Poltergeist and this one was its own, it definitely would have had a lot better reviews and things like that. I think it would have done okay. So as a movie... Yeah, I would recommend it to people who like scary movies because I feel like this one has the whole since it was made in 1982, it's not super ter- it's not super terrifying because of the older touch. So I feel like it, it kind of it's a good balance. So for younger generation, definitely. Um, for older generation who have grown up with the original 1982, <laughs> go into it and give it the benefit of the doubt. Is all I would say. Just kind right. of let it. It is what it is. It, to me, the original was an event film. That was just, and it was the combination of the the actors and the creative staff behind it, Spielberg and Toby Hooper and all them. Um, and this one, it it suffers from there not being event movies really anymore. I mean, Lord of the Rings maybe, but even then, that's sort of a niche audience there. I feel like the closest we've gotten is Star Wars Seven. Right. And yeah. Even, uh, Okay. Even then, we don't have lines around the buildings anymore at movie theaters because they play them on multiple screens. Yeah, you I know? feel like that's. The, but I don't feel like that's. I think think that's better for the people though because it can a generate more business. But it's just, I feel like that just is something that I wouldn't I necessarily count to make it a a huge film. Was because like like we like I've been to movie theaters who have like had huge lines that have reached the doors. But if they ha- if they were to go around the building, I don't. I feel like this generation would actually like walk away and think it's not worth it because <laughs> they're impatient. Yeah, I feel like yeah. Of... See, back in the day, that was the big deal. That was you know that was fun. Actually, we we went to see something. You and I went to see something in the. It was a sneak preview of something, and the line was outside the building. What was that? We had advanced tickets. Was it Abraham Lincoln? No. Was it Pride and Prejudice and Zombie? No, I didn't see that one. I... It was in Boston. We saw it at the Boston Common Cinema. Oh, yes. 
I remember getting out of the train, the subway, and the line was out the it door. Was Terminator? Terminator Genesis, maybe? Yes. I yeah, think so. I think that's what it I was. I think that, that's what it was. <laughs> so it does, it does happen on occasion, just very rarely. I mean, especially that was just on one screen. Yeah, so. that was on one screen, so. Now, the original film, um, the budget was $10.7 million, and it grossed $121 million, over almost $122 million. Um, and according to, according to Rotten Tomatoes, it's 88% fresh and 78% upright by the audience. Uh, the new film, the budget was $35 million. That's like three times the budget of the original. And it only grossed $95 million, um, which it still made its budget back. Um, but the critics gave it, in, in Rotten Tomatoes, critics gave it 31% fresh. And the audience upright was, uh, it wasn't very upright. It was only 22%. So it didn't do very well. I don't think we'll be seeing a sequel to this. Uh, for me personally, I thought it was okay. I think I agree with your assessment of it, that younger people would like it. Had they called it something else? You know, much like several other remakes, if they just called it something different and did things just slightly differently, you know, yeah, you could draw comparisons to the original, but it would be its own unique thing, which it had enough uniqueness in it. Um, but I just felt that they took away a lot of what made the original um, special um, by by sort of just numbing, not numbing, not dumbing down, but just toning down everything that had impact in the original movie. Um, and I think they, that might have hindered them because they were trying to do something different from the original to the point it's like, well, then why are you even bothering to remake it, you know? Yeah. Um, but that's it. So there we go. Good ones. Um, Poltergeist 1982 and 2015. Um, go out, seek them out, and let us know what you think. Let us know what you think of the show. Um, you can email us at thenisnow42 at gmail.com. And uh, we're, we're, we can be reached on facebook.com slash then is now podcast and our website is horrorhaven.com oh and good news we're on itunes now so oh. if you want to get on itunes and subscribe to us and uh one last thing that i forgot to mention earlier in the show is um in the first episode we had mentioned because our email is then is now 42 at gmail.com and i said if you know what 42 is let us know and we had one response to that <laughs> It's a gentleman named Song, who is the co-host of the Planet Lumina podcast, which is the General Hospital podcast, and he guessed correctly that it was from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So, Song, if you listen to this, uh, send us your address, and we'll mail you out a cool prize. I, I don't know what it is, but I'll announce it on the next show. And uh, that's it. So we're, we're not going to do another contest right now until we start building up an audience. And and uh, once we do that, we'll um, we'll have more contests, more fun. Check us out on horrorhaven.com. You can also download the, the quiz. And that'll cover some of the stuff in the first few episodes, and uh, we'll go from there. So thanks a lot, Spencey Donepeace, for joining us. No problem. And we'll catch you next time on Then Is Now Podcast. Okay, well, we hope you enjoyed Episode 3 of Then Is Now Podcast, the podcast where we teach you about all the cool stuff that you may have missed out on. Today was Poltergeist. Your homework for next episode is to watch the classic science fiction movie Forbidden Planet. That's the one starring Leslie Nielsen, Walter Pidgeon, and Anne Francis from 1956. And um, it's really awesome. It's a great movie. So check that out. And uh, that's what we're going to be discussing on our next episode of Then Is Now Podcast. And we hope you enjoy the show and join us again next time. Hello.